right, Comes. Welcome back to the Honeycomb Hideout. I'm your host, your Scent Master Thirst King, Joe Kane. And with me, as always, is my co pilot, co conspirator, collaborator, Christine Kitchens. I'm here. We did it, Joe. We showed up. <laughs> <laughs> We're so proud of us for actually showing up. Be, be, be very proud of us. Be very, very proud of us. But also, Welcome to 2024. This is the first episode of the new year. And we warned y'all we were going on hiatus, so you can't be mad because we there haven't been any new episodes lately. But here we are. <laughs> we are back in 2024 is um yeah, not much different from 2023. I'm not gonna lie. There's uh not a not a great air of change <laughs> this year. Um but hey, we still got ten more months to see what happens. <laughs> I like how you said that with the same energy of like, don't worry, guys. There's ten months left <laughs> this year. <laughs> like, yeah, because until until things turn around in the right way, that's the that's the mood. Like. Yes, like I, I would, I wear my, I, I, I proudly wear my Ouroboros Loki shirt anytime the mood strikes me. And his, his catchphrase is, well, according to New Rock Stars, his catchphrase is, "We're all gonna die." And I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, no, no, no that's that's a vibe, that, yo. Oh, that is the absolute vibe of 2024." <laughs> so yes, here come yes. these. Our souls are eroding. <laughs> 2024 <laughs> already feels so fucking long. Yep. But something <laughs> wonderful did arrive mid-January. Oh yeah, I, some yeah. something that incited the uh, uh, what's what's it called the ADHD upset obsessive uh, um, the, um, hyperfixation. Hyperfixation. Yeah, that's yeah, the yeah. Term. That's, that's correct. The term. Yeah. Uh, deep dive into AO3. Yeah, it's uh, it's. Good. I have about ten tabs open on my phone right now. Yes, no. We are talking about the premiere and conclusion of the first season of Has Been Hotel, which mm-hmm. is on Amazon Prime. <laughs> and this is a little bit of preamble to what the full show is going to be out about. Right. But first, I'm going to gush about this show <laughs> <laughs> because fucking awesome so like i love irreverent adult animation like you know Mm. netflix made that tag and it feels like it was for me (laughs) um it's like you know thinking in the vein of stuff like futurama big Mm. mount um simpsons Mm. going back a little bit more (laughs) those kinds of shows where it's animated style but there is (laughs) this was not made for children (laughs) and has been hotel is the work of I'm definitely gonna fucking fuck this up. Hold on. <laughs> Let me consult real quick. Oh yeah. So I can try to get this correct. Because there's <laughs> the creator has like a handle. Yeah. Uh creator of I think it's Vizzy Pop, but I don't think I, I don't think that's their Yes, you're correct. Okay. Yeah. Uh actual name is Vivian Madrano mm-hmm. and Vivzy Pop. Vivzy Pop? Viv- 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 <laughs> anyway, Funky. so this is an interesting person because mm. their main platform is YouTube. Mm-hmm. And yep. they've been doing their own animation and story stuff for a while. Mm-hmm. And the same way you might wait for a webcomic for like a single page to come out once every two months. Vivzy? Mm. <laughs> Vivzy <laughs> Pop. We're going to do this about 12 times before this is done. Easily. Uh, has a similar thing going for her creation. I believe mm. it's she, her. But um, yeah. she actually has the show called Hell of a Boss that's yes. been around for a while and I believe exclusively exists on her YouTube channel. Correct. And this is an animation that is super 18 up. <laughs> like you are hearing like high demons talking about how they like to get their bussy pounded <laughs> in the dead of night and first thing in the morning. Like that's the kind of like manic energy that's in the show. Mm-hmm. But it's also bringing in a lot of these 
classic creatures we think mm. of when we think of hell. Mm. Hellhounds, imps, mm-hmm. um, high demons, that sort of thing. Okay, okay. And Hell of a Boss, I think, got kind of a cult following. Oh, well, yes. Yeah. And I think, you know, they got the merch. They got the pop figurines, I think. Um, They've got the tumblers. They got the tumblers. Yep. Mm-hmm. And Hasbun Hotel is something that actually spun out of a different creation. I think it was a webcomic that she does um, mm. called Something. Mm. Called Something. Yeah. The webcomic was called. I, I know. It, it definitely started. Zoophobia. Out... Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. So Hasbun Hotel was a spinoff from Zoophobia because originally there was supposed to be this sequence that was taking place in hell. Mm-hmm. And she realized looking at all these characters, she's like, you know, these guys are pretty cool. They might be cool enough to actually have their own shit. Mm. And so I believe the planned arc in Zoophobia mm. got axed. And instead, we got the pilot for Hasbun Hotel. Mm, okay. Which, holy fuck, I think came out like two, two years ago, four years ago. Four years ago. Four years ago. Oh, my God. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. So I caught this pilot when it was released four years ago, and I immediately fell in love. But I, I just assumed that that's as far it was ever going to fucking go. And I let it slip off of my brain because that's what you have to do with shit you find on the Internet sometimes. You just got to forget about it for a couple of years and then come back and check on it. Mm-hmm. So I was tremendously pleased uh, <laughs> towards the end of last year mm-hmm. when I heard that Amazon Prime had picked up – um has been a hotel mm. and I was ready for it. And <laughs> I believe it released something like mid January and they yep. were dropping two episodes every Thursday. Mm-hmm. And the first season has just completed. It's eight episodes in total. And holy fuck. <laughs> it's adult animation. It's a reverent adult animation. Mm-hmm. And there's fucking songs in there. <laughs> like, I don't know what I, the primitive best- <laughs> childlike wonder this thing taps into when they're like, here are some really intense, like, demon railing and cursing and, like, doing drugs. But also, here's this Disney song to go with it. And you're like, you know what? I'm entranced. <laughs> I'd like to think of Has Been a Hotel as an as a emo theater kid in college's wet dream. It's true. Honestly, that's legit. Yeah. The Forgotten Disney Princess, Charlie Morningstar. Uh, yeah. So I was obsessed pretty much immediately because this was hitting all my buttons. Mm-hmm. And everybody should go watch it, first of all. <laughs> I made Joe go watch it. <laughs> yes, she did. My partners have probably seen the series like three times now just by merit of being in the same room as me. I, I'm i surprised only three. Yeah. Well, you know, they've learned to walk away after a while. They, it's important to know when to walk away. The hyper fixation <laughs> phases are great for me, but be, can be kind of intense for the people living with me. No, really? Yeah, it's like you should just mention the movie <laughs> Sing too when Jay is around and see what, how they respond. But, but all that aside, it's mm. a great show. Everybody should go catch that shit. Go mm. watch the pilot on the YouTube channel. Go look at some of the prequel comics it that are floating been, around out there. That, that, that original animation... Has like 50 million views. Mm hmm. Holy shit. Mm hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Mm-hmm. But I love the show and I fucking love some of these characters because mm-hmm. uh, this is kind of a minor spoiler alert, but you know, spoiler alert nonetheless. That mm-hmm. one of the like main cast characters is Lucifer Morningstar, Fallen mm-hmm. Angel. I mean, it's hell. He has to be involved. That's somehow. right. You're right. King of hell. Yeah. yeah. And I love this guy so goddamn much. Like, you should see the simping for this man on the internet. Not going like, to lie. Lucifer is kind of one of my favorite characters yeah. of the show. Everything I've ever seen is like, we love our short king. <laughs> it's, it's so good. And Lucifer Morningstar is like this mm-hmm. very strange, quirky character mm-hmm. in the Hasbun Hotel universe. Mm. where he's the king of hell. He has insane magical abilities. Like, mm-hmm. he can open up pocket dimensions. Mm-hmm. He has all six of his seraphim wings mm-hmm. in this particular iteration. Oh, yeah. He can transform into fucking anything, and mm-hmm. he will pound your face into pavement. Like, zero issues. Um, mm-hmm. But then it's like, when we're really first introduced to them, the very first thing we see is this guy alone in his workshop 
surrounded by a million rubber ducks. And he's so excited about his brand new rubber duck that spits fire. And so you were introduced to this guy who is depressed, who has this weird love of rubber ducks. And, but it was also very powerful. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of sitting and looking at this character. And I felt like this is such a neat presentation Mm -hmm. of the character of Lucifer Morningstar. Mm -hmm. Because there are a lot of shows and books and things out there that will present, you know, Lucifer as everything from, like, that very stereotypical horned red devil to, you know, somebody who's actually was the good guy all along, you know, Mm -hmm. a la the television show Lucifer. Yeah. And here was the, I love this character presentation because... Mm -hmm. He's almost immediately presented as, like, this depressed guy in a funk Mm -hmm. who is kind of goofy, but also is really fucking powerful Mm -hmm. and is, like, ultimately, like, very proud of his daughter and wants to protect her. And so, like, this is, like, a very... What's the word I'm looking for? Like, empathetic character. Somebody that you can empathize with and be like, yeah, I kind of see myself Mm -hmm. in this dude. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. That got me thinking, though, Mm. is that... I love the show, but it is not the first to take the setting of hell mm-hmm. as it's portrayed, you know, a la Dante's Inferno, you know, mm-hmm. with these multiple rings of hell and, you know, we're tormenting sinners and things mm-hmm. like that. And playing around with the idea of it or playing around with the idea of biblical themes in general mm-hmm. in a very fun, derivative, fan fiction kind of way. Mm-hmm. And so I kind of wanted to talk about that. Oh, yeah. Is, you know, zooming out from Has Been Hotel, Mm -hmm. which everybody should fucking watch. (laughs) (laughs) I wanted to talk a little bit today about what, in my head, I have dubbed biblical fan fiction. Mm. So, again, we're thinking about Has Been Hotel. We're thinking about the television show Lucifer. I mean, if you really want to get to it, fucking Life of Brian, like that kind (laughs) of shit. Like, what is it that... People see these very, I'm trying to use the right words here, like holy thing, Mm -hmm. like, and they want to take it and they want to play with it and turn it into something more human, not Mm. divine so much as human and, you know, something you can relate to. Mm, And I don't know if it's just because of me being an American audience Mm. member but I feel like I don't see that same level of play with a lot of the other major religions out there. Mm. Like thinking about, um, you know, Jewish faith and mm, yeah. the, um, Joe, help me out. Why am I blanking here? Uh, let's see. You mentioned Christian, Christianity, Judaism. Bible is to um, Christian as yeah. blank is to Jewish. Uh, uh, Judaism. Like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I'm gonna I'm gonna fumble a little bit here, oh, and I'm gonna right. ask, ask your grace here. I'm trying to think, what is the uh, what's the holy book of um, Judaism? The Torah? Yeah. No, that's not oh, right. That's the dance. That's the dance. No, no, no. It's very different. Okay. Oh well, my god! Go to, wow! I did gonna... not have enough caffeine for this. It turns out. Nope. Uh, so, uh, so we are going to the internet to figure this out. Now, if it, if it's the Torah, I'm gonna be pissed. But at the same time. Rather be sure than not. And Ooh, not much of a signal in here. It was the Torah. Oh, I'm not full of shit. All right. But yeah, which I guess mm-hmm. objectively is basically the same book. Mm. But, you know. But there, there's a lot of similarities between Judaism and uh, and Christianity. They're cut from similar cloths. But yeah, so mm-hmm. like, you know, Joe, do me a favor. List off. <laughs> 
because you are the ultimate consumer of media. <laughs> List off some movies, shows, mm. fiction offhand mm-hmm. that take biblical characters and mm. reimagine them, either personality-wise or in mm-hmm. a modern world, anything like that. Okay. Um, well, uh, honestly, the big, the biggest examples uh, are, are, of course, Lucifer. Um, let's see. Le- Legion is one that actually is surprisingly really, really decent. Legion, as in a, it's actually a film about an angel that falls to protect people from other angels. Um, really interesting story based off of a, uh, was it a manga or just an independent comic? Not sure. Anyway, um, Dogma. Um, oh, Dogma. Yes. <laughs> The movie that taught me that I didn't have to be a Christian to be a good person. That's a story. That it, yeah. It, that's a, I'm all, that's all I'm going to say. That's a story. Well, I'll tell it eventually. Um, but, um, but basically the, uh, so there's that, um, in a unique twist, panty and stocking with garter belt, a really ridiculously raunchy crude anime about angels trying to earn their way back into heaven by killing demons and, you know, undead evils and shit. But one is... uh, Yes, this is an 18-plus podcast, but there is fucked up shit going on in that anime. That's all I'm going to get into. Um, But yeah, like, the funny... And the funny thing is, mentioning it from a theological standpoint, like, the, you know, standard heaven-hell binary, like, a lot of times... Those are usually very prominent in like very big gray stories. The ones with oh, Sandman. Mm. I almost missed Sandman, um, but yeah, no, it's Sandman, uh, like one of the best ones. But in terms of, it's only in like recent years where you really started to see the uh, black and white of it start to blur a bit, where. People started to kind of turn 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 its axis, not fully in the other direction. Some people did. Some some creators have fully switched the binary, but more often than not, you'll see them play in the middle ground where it's like, yeah, hell is definitely not what you think it is, but neither is heaven, mm-hmm. which is a much more interesting story rather than hell's fucking great, fuck heaven, <laughs> which is just like. That's the easy thing to do. That's what the other motherfuckers did. Come on, show us something about both of them, please. <laughs> but um, but yeah, but um, yeah, it's mostly been in like the lad, like from the '90s on, where you really start to see the nuances of like, you know, Lucifer Morningstar from who, who um, you know, Lucifer actually spun out of Sandman. Uh, the the TV show Lucifer you mentioned that's actually a spinoff from Sandman. Really? Yeah, the comic was anyway. They kind of cut ties from the Sandman side of things because Fox wasn't trying to go that deep into it. Oh yeah. My- yeah. Joe, speaking of new <laughs> game, and you know what we totally fucking forgot in this conversation? Oh uh, shit! It was fucking good omens. Oh, oh fuck. wow! That was a big oh, missing one on a yeah. holy oh, shit! Damn, yeah. yes, no, Good Omens had definitely has to be mentioned, which is another really great one because it's like, yeah, no, heaven and hell has assholes on both sides, <laughs> which I I definitely appreciate, and also, yeah, no, I I basically ship the main characters. I mean, it, it, it's hard duh, not it's duh. hard not to. I'm pretty sure at this point, even the creator ship the main yeah. characters. Yeah. Um, I like, can't even describe <laughs> the percentage of my Facebook feed that is like good omens it, memes. Aziraphale X Crowley. Oh. It's like starting to be inundated by the Hasman Hotel shopping, but um, mm, yeah. but yeah. So I think I, I think <laughs> well, you yeah. said something very interesting here. Mm. The idea of trying to enter that gray space. Mm. And presenting, you know, these two. Yeah, good and evil. Yeah, good and evil. And, the, mm. you know, these places beyond death. Mm-hmm. Um, and showing that it's not really in a binary. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm wondering, again, 
like I said, I, I, in my head, I'm like, this is biblical fan fiction. Because it's <laughs> absolutely what it is. Somebody wanted to do an AU. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, but if you really think about it, all theology is fan fiction. It is, well, yeah, it yeah. is. All but, theology is fan fiction until you get to the other side and you find out who, if anyone, was right. So, <laughs> yes, um, I said it. <laughs> so I'm wondering, like, okay, so related to this question. Uh, yeah. So all, <clears throat> I'm quoting Joe here. <laughs> <laughs> Please rewind 15 seconds to get the full context. <laughs> All theology is fan fiction. Um, okay, so this is actually even more interesting now that we're talking about this. Mm-hmm. Because if, again, kind of focusing in on Christian faith in particular, mm. um, if the Bible mm. was the OG fan fiction, <laughs> and... As far as I've understood, there have been tons and tons and tons of different translations of this Bible. And oh, tons God. and tons of iterations. Mm-hmm. So moving into the digital age, like mm. we are now, where so much of everything exists mm. online and via visual media and audiobooks and stuff like that, mm. it kind of makes sense that as we're migrating away from those physical written texts, mm. That there's still that human desire to reimagine mm-hmm. their biblical fan fiction. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Via a medium that is more conducive to the ages. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're still you still have stuff like Veggie Tales, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's still there. <laughs> it's still there. Mm-hmm. But um. But it is interesting how even it, it's so timeless mm. to play around with these, this idea mm-hmm. of heaven and hell and morality specifically framed within mm. a biblical context. Oh, yeah. And so, Joe, <laughs> do you feel like looking at stuff like Tasman Hotel, looking mm-hmm. at... Lucifer, I keep reaching for those because they're just at the top of my oh. brain list. Um, also, Tom Ellis was a fantastic Lucifer Morningstar. Yeah, he really <laughs> fucking was. He really was. <laughs> um, do you feel like more modern iterations of that play around with these mm. theological ideas mm-hmm. are uniformly becoming more grave? Like, there's mm. no longer so much that story of this place is good. This is mm-hmm. ba- this place is bad. Mm-hmm. Are we now getting to a place where kind of everybody is converging on this idea of it's not so black and white mm. because it's what I guess I'm trying to get at here is mm. is there some kind of mirroring of broader societal interpretations of morality at play? Mm. Are like are we as a society starting to understand the idea that it's not so black and white mm. that people end up in quote unquote bad places for all kinds of reasons? Mm. Um, because going to Hasbin Hotel in particular, you learn throughout the season mm. that there are a lot of people who are down there for a lot of different reasons, mm-hmm. and there are some weird things that can get you down there. Mm -hmm. And in fact, a major plot point of the show, spoiler alert, (laughs) is they find out that the angels in heaven don't know what the fucking criteria are for Mm -hmm. people to show up. (laughs) And I have theories about that, by the way. We're going to get into it later. We'll we'll get into it later. We'll get into it later. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's this idea of like, it feels like such a 20s thing to do, I suppose, technically, like, you know, a 1500s thing to do, to yeah. be very, like, hardlining mm-hmm. that if you do this, you are going to hell. If you mm-hmm. do this, you are going to heaven. Mm-hmm. But as we are in the midst of that information age where we see and hear more stories and mm-hmm. understand and see a lot more different perspectives, you understand that. 
there's a lot more to be viewed beyond the action itself. It's the context surrounding it. Mm -hmm. So, for example, you know, this is going to be kind of an extreme one, but I'm going to put it out there. Um, (laughs) If you have somebody who was a prostitute Mm. and, you know, she had a pimp Mm. and she's trying to get out and, you know, there's some sort of altercation that breaks out and Mm. she, like, fucking kills the pimp or goes to the cop or something like that, you know, it's, there. there is so much happening there. Mm-hmm. But there are a lot of people who might be like, you know what, Th- that person is terrible and evil because they were doing this quote unquote evil thing, mm-hmm. when in reality there's a lot around it. And mm-hmm. so what I'm wondering is, is the show Has Been Hotel a sign of our changing view of morality through a religious lens. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, there's really no way of getting around it, especially because of the fact that it comes from someone of the generation where that that mentality is at its most, um, well, what's the term? Most prolific. Like, because ultimately... We've often lived in eras of hard and of hard, fast rules. I mean, because the moral morality is very, very black and white. I mean, t- tossing some examples out there, like you know, gay people, trans people, all all these types of people have existed throughout history. There is literal proof that there have always been gay people. There have always been people that have been ca- experienced gender dysphoria or have always felt that they are not who they are meant to be in their own body. This, that, these sorts of things have always existed throughout history. They've only been truly acknowledged on a wider scale until the last 20, 30 years. I mean, even in the, even in the 60s and 70s, during you know, like, you know, Stonewall and things like that, they, we, you knew they existed, but they were not acknowledged, if you get my meaning. Mm-hmm. So now there is a time that we're reaching a point where you have to acknowledge them because these people are the people of the of these backgrounds are refusing to be ignored. They are taking their inalienable right to be able to live and exist in the way of their choosing. And that in that in in that that's also letting loose a whole other cavalcade of questions i like to call it because as soon as certain things start happening other things start it all dominoes into each other in different ways like as cultures start to blend and be exposed to each other you start having all these different mentalities all these moralities start you know, coming to the forefront and people start asking questions. Like, God made us all in his image. Then why would he have made all these other people? Why would he have allowed gay people to exist? Folks with gender dysphoria. Why is, or why do these people exist if God made humanity in, his, in, in their image? I also subscribe to God, God being... Gender neutral, but that's just me. <laughs> um, but yeah, but that's the thing. And as the questions pile up, no one in the past generation is really going to have satisfying answers. So a lot of the young young creatives are going out there trying to, well, young people in general are going out there trying to find their own answers. And some people find it in other faiths and religions. Other people find it in within their own mythologies. Some people reinterpret the mythologies and theologies that already are there. Because some people find their truth in the buried past. And it's kind of it's kind of awesome seeing some of that happen. But it also starts bringing up a lot of contradictions in what has already been written. Like the fact that like if you really look at it. I love that you brought up Lucifer Morningstar because I think there's a lot going on with that character that a lot of people have gotten onto, but not in a way that they realize. Because here's the thing. 
Lucifer is technically like in his interpretation in Hasman Hotel is the first dreamer to be denied by their parent. The one that wanted to, you know, like, you know, push like the one that wanted to go to Hollywood and pursue their dream. And God said, no, because then your brothers and sisters are going to want to do that shit too. Now, the thing of it is that we still don't know really what it was that got uh, God or actually if I, actually if I remember correctly, was Lucifer already kicked out of heaven by the time uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember before it has been hotel. Was Lucifer and Lilith already kicked out of heaven out of the garden by the time um damn it, I am really mixing up my shit here. Okay, okay, okay. Was Lucifer already kicked out of heaven by the time he met Lilith? No. Okay. No. Okay. It, the the order of events in okay. the universe of Hasman mm-hmm. Hotel mm-hmm. were that Lucifer was like, yo, okay. what if we put crazy ducks everywhere? Mm-hmm. And all the other angels and seraphim are like, bro, mm-hmm. no. Oh, okay. <laughs> and like put him in the corner. Okay. And they started create and they created Adam and Eve. Okay. And then no, sorry. Let me let me actually walk the back. Oh, they okay. created Adam and Lilith. The Adam and Lilith, yes. And then Lilith was like, I'm not really looking to be subjugated, yo. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> left the garden. And Lucifer was like, bruh. And they had like they 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 had took their Bonnie and Clyde energy mm-hmm. and they went and they approached Eve and they were like, like Yo, mm. you wanna get wild with us? And Eve <laughs> was like, Fuck yeah. And uh after that that was the point when evil entered the world with yeah. free will mm-hmm. and when the angels cast both Lucifer and Lilith into hell. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. So that was when they were cast. Which is interesting because if I remember the original lore, <laughs> Lucifer was already a um, was already a fallen angel and in hell by the time Adam and Adam and Lilith came about. So that that is an interesting twist on the lore. But I see, I I can I definitely see, well, considering what they chose to how what um, Vivian uh, chose to do with the lore of Hasbin Hotel completely works for where she's going. Um, I mean, fact of the matter is, um, you'll see you see in anime that they use Buddhist Buddhist mythology in its own ways a lot of times too. So, but um, anyway, going back to what I was saying, um. Lucifer is fascinating because of the fact that he's basically, he's the dreamer that, he's the cautionary tale of the dreamer that dreamed too big, is basically where they go, where they went with Lucifer. So, you got that, and then you have the, um, fuck, I went off my own, I I jumped off my own train. (laughs) Um, So, you have that. And that is a whole different context from most versions of Lucifer. Like even in terms of, you know, Sandman, they play up the evilish side of things. But this is the first version of Lucifer Morningstar that I've seen is like, he's not evil. He's literally just depressed and surrounded by the absolute worst of humanity. You fucking know uh this version of Lucifer, mm-hmm. what he deadass reminded me of. What that? Dead- Okay, you know, so like the greatest show came out, like what, like uh, oh, you mean the greatest showman? Greatest showman, there we go. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Came he, out, you know, mm-hmm. P.T. Barnum. Yeah, yeah. It was to me, it was that portrayal of P.T. Barnum if he was also a seraphim, because mm. like you know. Okay. Here's here's my pitch. I actually have not seen the movie, so. <sighs> okay, so this is only gonna work so well. Hmm. Joe, we gotta watch this. It's a musical, <laughs> so you're gonna have to tolerate that. <laughs> but um, but I love. Hey, show. I do not hate musicals. I do not hate musicals, but it needs to be a good one with a good story. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, so a little bit of context on that mm-hmm. particular movie is P.T. Barnum in the this movie mm-hmm. was somebody who grew up very poor mm-hmm. and was trying and was a dreamer. Mm-hmm. Like he had these fantastic visions and the, of the kind of show that he wanted to portray, mm-hmm. but and he did come up with a fucking kick ass show but he got mm-hmm. carried away mm. and in his pursuit of this bigger better show mm. he ended up putting his loved ones um mm. at financial peril mm. you know kind of neglecting them cuz all he mm. could see was mm-hmm. 
the magic and wonder and the show must go on. Uh-huh. And to me, Lucifer Morningstar and Hasbun Hotel was the same fucking way. Mm, okay. Like there was like even the specific circus iconography. Mm. Like they were they were clearly painting this guy as a ringmaster mm. who wanted to put on this wild show. Yeah, and, a lot of a lot of fashion choices definitely pointed ringmaster. Yeah, and apparently that's a theme that's consistent in some of the other works of Disney Pop. Okay. <laughs> this is about to be the Wario situation all over again. Um, and and that was really interesting uh-huh. too because in and of that it feels like it took away mm. it was less of a question about good and evil yeah. more of like you know somebody <laughs> wanted to go off to Hollywood and mm-hmm. do this crazy drama uh-huh. I mean we've all, we've all got our dramatic friends who are out going out there and doing crazy shit and we're I, like okay you're being a little dramatic but you know okay mm-hmm. but um, imagine if you had that and then you also had the ability to like create the universe mm. um, yeah like nobody likes to have their vision suppressed nope. and <laughs> <laughs> But I actually like, okay, I'm actually going to bring back another point that oh. you kind of glazed over. <laughs> oh, okay. But that was kind of buzzing around in the back of my mind. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned in passing mm. that you had seen something similar mm. with anime and mm-hmm. Buddhist ic- iconography and yes. religion. And so this is this can be a follow-up question. Because mm-hmm. I know I keep throwing around, like, <laughs> biblical fan fiction mm-hmm. as the term of the day. Oh, yeah. But... Is this something that we're experiencing universally in mm. terms of different religions? Because, I mean, we both watch fucking anime. So, like, I think we could hands down mm-hmm. say that there is a mirroring of this mm-hmm. phenomenon in Shinto. Oh, like, the, the, the number of animes out there that are just, like, flipping, um, mm-hmm. you know, some of these classical, you know, figures mm-hmm. in Shinto and other faiths mm-hmm. that are kind of more prevalent over in the east oh yeah um so like that for sure but it's like do we see that extending because japan japan just gets fucking weird no matter what like y- you can say oh yeah japan does this too but japan is also like welcome to our convenience so- store slash porn store slash candy store you know like they're just and they always have great selection of all three they always do mm-hmm. um but do we, so like, that, that almost doesn't count because they're always, <laughs> they've always been balls to the walls. They're always going to be balls to the walls. Um, mm-hmm. But it feels like this, that shift in media and the Christian faith mm-hmm. has been relatively recent. Like, you know, mm-hmm. in the past three decades, something like that, I would say. I, would, I personally would actually say four. I would say this has definitely been on the rise since at least the 80s. Like the seventies had like you know certain psychedelic aspects within. I, I I always attribute it back to comics, but comics was kind of the primary medium, where a lot of ideas, you know, comics, novels, what have you, literature. That was where the really far out shit was really happening, but it didn't always get the main kind of traction. But then in the eighties, once the import of other other nations' materials. That's when you know, like when different anime started really making a started really making a splash over here. Um, that when the imports of other comics from other from other countries, yada yada. That's I'd say the eighties on up is definitely when that paradigm shift started happening, mm-hmm. and that is and I think that's where the really deep, like like the really deep thinkers started coming up. Well, not only that, but you're that's also coincident with a mm-hmm. lot of civil rights movements too. Mm. Is kind of really interesting to think about. Mm-hmm. See now now see this is where <laughs> we're gonna have to work really hard because uh-huh. now I'm like, whoa. Uh-huh. Um uh-huh. Cause now I'm thinking about, you know, what were at the time where we started to see this uptick in mm-hmm. media that has that reimagined mm-hmm. heaven and hell and morality mm-hmm. in a Christian universe. Mm-hmm. Oh, now I am sitting here and asking the question of like, what are some of the other things that were happening around the time? But you make an interesting point mm-hmm. that, you know, we were starting to 
reach towards globalism, I think, mm-hmm. at this point. We're starting to get other things from other people. We're starting to get more perspectives, mm-hmm. which I would argue lends credence to my argument <laughs> that as we are moving more towards the digital age and era that, mm-hmm. you know, stuff like Has Been Hotel, stuff mm-hmm. like um, Good Omens. Mm-hmm. That show <laughs> Oh my god! When they had them kiss at the end of season two, I almost <laughs> flipped my fucking couch out of sheer excitement. Um, but you know, we we start to see those very dramatic, arguably more liberal reimaginings of mm-hmm. who's good, who's evil. Mm-hmm. Is anybody strictly good, strictly evil? That mm-hmm. kind of question. And I mean, especially you, <laughs> like if you think about season two of Good Omens, mm. which I think was something that was created kind of the same way that they started to do the later seasons of um, Handmaid's Tale, where there was the Mm. original content of the book, which was season one of Good Mm. Good Omens. Mm -hmm. And then season two on was like totally recently made up Mm -hmm. shit. Yeah. Like like the rest of our biblical fan fiction. (laughs) Um, But, you know, even in that season, Mm -hmm. you saw parallels of people being drawn into Mm. relationships with people who are quote unquote from the other side of the table. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of those were romantic, which yay. Mm. But you know, also some of those that are more platonic Mm -hmm. of like interactions between individual angels and demons. Mm -hmm. And, you know, seeing that where you're coming from doesn't necessarily preclude your ability Mm -hmm. to form a relationship with somebody from the other side. And And that, Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. And that was fairly recent. And so Mm. again, To me, there are things that are happening at the same time where Mm -hmm. in society, we are becoming more globalized. Mm -hmm. We're seeing more stuff. We're reading more stuff. We're getting more perspectives. Mm -hmm. Um, We're learning that things are not black and white, which Mm -hmm. is something that it feels like was very deeply ingrained into people even mm-hmm. a couple of generations ago was mm-hmm. like this is the way this is this is the way that is oh yeah you know if you're a sex worker you're a bad person and mm-hmm. uh if you go to church you're a good person you know like that kind of stuff which yep. we know is absolutely <laughs> incorrect and mm-hmm. i think when we see things like me too when we see mm-hmm. you know sex workers who are advocating to, for themselves and mm-hmm. telling their stories yeah. you're starting to have like you said you're having those reimaginings in your mm-hmm. mind of you know, those paradigm shifts of perspective, perspective. And, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe it makes sense that when people and um, creators, Mm -hmm. like you were mentioning, they play around this idea. It makes Mm -hmm. sense that they do it through the lens of religion, because Mm -hmm. this for so many people is where their personal morality stems Mm -hmm. from Mm -hmm. is, you know, what does the Bible say is a good and a bad person? What does the Quran say is a good and a bad person? Mm -hmm. Torah, um, Mm -hmm. What are the Shinto texts? I don't know. (laughs) Buddhist texts. You know, what, you know, because for so many people, this is where their morality is derived from. So Mm -hmm. when we're starting to have these questions around this, maybe it ultimately makes sense that creators can't help but turn to this theater and these puppets to try and play out these questions that Mm -hmm. they're having. And, uh, And the funny thing that you mentioned that, and I think a lot of that really does stem from theater, from the, um, interpretation of these various ideas because we come from the Disney generation, let us be honest. And ultimately, how many of our generation, well, technically mine, then yours, Christine's younger than me, y'all, and every now and again I remember and it frustrates that. I just need you to forget about that. That's all I need to do is just forget about that, Joe. <laughs> um, but yes, but uh, the ultimately the... The gen- Disney generation really gravitated towards the villains, if you remember. Mm-hmm. You know, like Ur- the Ursula, Scar, um, um, Hell, Jafar. Mm-hmm. And like, th- and there are so many like villains that became like these cornerstones for so many different types of people. And you just start to wonder, okay, why are the villains being so like, you know, deified, if you want to call it something? Like, where's the, why is the hero worship for the villains? But then you start to realize because the villains are reflecting a lot of the uh, traits and aspects of the audience, 
that the audience is not seeing represented in their heroes. That's so that's where a lot of that is coming from. And I think that's where a lot of the, the like the inversion, the um, you know, the graying of morality is coming from as well. Because a lot of people are starting to see that these things that are being considered, you know, sinful and evil are certain aspects of them, like, you know, eating meat and, and fucking on a Tuesday, what have you. Um, the things that the Bible considered sinful, certain of them are just like, these actually aren't hurting anyone. But then you have the other, then you have other ones where there is still definitely a line between what can be considered good and evil. I will stand by that because it all boils down to harm. It all boils down to harm beyond oneself. Now, harm of thyself, that's something else entirely. We're not talking about that today. But I think it all, I think it all comes down to people started to realize the things that were being vilified were things that were not really harming anyone, at least not in the modern context. In the, as it's a, there's an old Chris Rock joke that honestly really kind of set this the wheels in motion for me way back in the day. It's like back in the day, pork could kill you because of the fact that folks back then didn't have the right means to store it. You know, they, they didn't know the, all the best ways to cook it, prepare it, all that jazz. So certain, you know, pork, certain products were bad for you. So a lot of, so a lot of these, you know, leaders would use certain texts to say, this is a sinful product. You should not touch this. But time changes. We evolve. We develop technologies. Now, in the words of Chris Rock, a pork chop's your fucking friend. <laughs> so, but that's, but it, it, I, I'd say all that to say this. It, time evolves and people evolve with it. But the fact of the matter is these things were set in place the way they were for a reason. And usually it was for a perceived greater good. And that might have been the case at that time but time moves for and it stays still for no one and as time moves people change along with it so the so because of that because of all these steadfast rules that are still trying to be adhered to people are starting to push back on them because the harm that they used to cause is no longer the case and now the lack of the harm that people are trying to prevent is now actually causing harm and they don't understand that because they still have the perspective of but this, this is a good this was a good thing back then they don't they lack the con they lack the perspective to realize then is not now and that's where a lot of this is coming from the younger generation is realizing there is n there isn't a great deal of the, the same kind of harm in this that there was back then. And now they're like, they're allowing themselves the freedom to experience and interpret and change their perspectives on things. Hence the hero worship of villains. Hence the questioning of specific moral, you know, cornerstones of society. Now, as I said, I do hold the, the narrative there is such a thing as good, you know, as solid goods and solid evils. But I think those are narrower than we realize. They are not as massive as they used to be. There are ways of interpreting things, and we need to be willing to ask those questions. We're not always going to like the answer, but we need to be prepared for that as well. And I think that's where a lot of young people are, where the, how a lot of young people like developed, where they realize that I know this is a sin, but this feels right. And that's where their morality evolved. And I, I think that's the big thing. Of, oh, excuse me. And I think that's the big thing of it. I think that's where stuff like this comes from, like Devil Man Cry Baby. 
I am a devil. I'm a devil may cry baby. <laughs> <laughs> Well, not not just devil may cry, but also devil See, we're man. We're not so cry different, baby. Joe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, no, but also the devil man, the, the devil man cry baby, um, anime uh, on uh, Netflix. Did you, you ever see? You saw I that have, one, right? I have not seen. Okay, that one. it's intense. It's brutal. I saw it one time. Never gonna watch it again. But it, it has some very very interesting shit to say along the same these same lines because the hero is literally possessed of devil powers. But he's also fighting against heaven, so it's so there's a lot there's a lot of stuff going on there that also fits in with this. But like effectively, there was a question that always that always used to plague me early on when I was like really starting to push as a writer. Can you use can you use evil means to do true good? And that very question is the kind of thing that no one would even attempt to ask in years past. But it's a question that, honestly, I can't help but ask these days. Because, I mean, look at how, look at all the, all, all the changes in fiction that we've been seeing. All these uh, relatable villains and mm-hmm, things like that, mm-hmm. which I kind of think we're overdoing it now, because let us be fair, there are evil motherfuckers out there and that is not necessarily unrealistic. <laughs> yeah, God, yes. you know, it's funny that you said that. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know if you also said this before, but I, I think, <laughs> in fact, I think it was you who said this. But um, again, yeah. reasons that I fucking liked Lucifer and <laughs> Hasman Hotel uh-huh. is that, you know, he's still relatable, mm-hmm. but he's not like, I don't think he fully falls into mm-hmm. that trap that you're talking about mm-hmm. of like bad guys being a little bit too good. Mm-hmm. Like Lucifer mm-hmm. in the television series, oh, Lucifer, like that guy was hot, but like he got <laughs> to a point where mm-hmm. like, even though he was supposed to be the bad guy, mm-hmm. you know, he was doing good things. And mm-hmm. even eventually, I think I didn't finish watching that series, but if mm-hmm. I'm remembering what I read mm-hmm. on the internet correctly, mm-hmm. you know, it even got to a point where there was an inversion of roles still mm-hmm. where, Rather than doing that whole, um, like, <laughs> God, I really need to be careful here because we're going to go down a way different rabbit hole. Uh-oh. Um, even when he started to exhibit what we portray as good behavior, mm-hmm. then that's when they started saying, oh, you're an angel again. Oh, mm-hmm. you're going to heaven again. There wasn't mm-hmm. this whole, like, you can yeah. be a good person and still mm-hmm. be, you know, yeah, you know, hellish in origin. Mm-hmm. Um, but, oh my God, that is going down. You know what? Yes. I'm gonna stop myself. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna get this back under control because uh-huh. now we are starting to get to uh, this oh, is yeah. very riveting for me. This is, but we are starting to get into like midnight gospel territory in terms oh, yeah. of like let's pop a couple tabs of acid and talk <laughs> morality and yeah, religion. No, we, we do not have that kind of time. Yeah, yeah, no, I think they're fixed out very soon. But uh, you know what? I'm gonna bring it back uh, with some science. No, yeah, let's do it. And there was actually one other thing that I do want to bring up. Before we dive into the science. Okay, okay, okay. And that was the fact that, another spoiler for a has-been hotel, the fact that the angels don't know what it takes to get into heaven. I have a theory about that. My theory is angels themselves are simply born of heaven. Thus, they do not know what it takes for a mortal to get there. They are incapable, but thus they are incapable of getting to heaven unless they themselves die they they are not they are just born of it they are not judged it's kind of the same thing as charlie charlie was born in hell but she was never judged and sent to hell so in a way they inherently bypass the very rules of the place that they are upholding so they're in a way the ultimate privileged yes yes Mm -hmm. i agree with that yes yeah for sure so that's why no angel knows what it takes to get into heaven because no angel has ever had to actually earn their way into heaven. That's just a show theory. <laughs> <laughs> Crossover. Oh, man. All right, all right, right. Has been <laughs> okay. hotel. Yes. So in honor of Alistair the Radio Demon. Oh, damn. I have gotten some radio facts. 
Which if uh, our friend Jeff ever listens to the show, I really hope these are in fact correct. Because <laughs> uh, if they're not, We're my good. homie is, is going to let me know about that. Yep. So fingers crossed, everybody. <laughs> Oh yeah, Jeff is definitely going to make sure to say something if it's That's not. Right. You don't need to know. You don't need to know <laughs> what the science when it was. Okay, so tell me, did you know that radio waves were theorized before they were discovered? Mm. The scientific community knew about radio waves before anyone discovered actual evidence of them. In 1865, Scottish mathematician and physicist John Clerk Maxwell predicted the existence of radio waves in a paper titled. A dynamical theory of a, the electromagnetic field based on a presentation he gave before the Royal Society in December 1864. He also did some other papers. Uh, da, 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 da. <laughs> but yeah, he like talked about like, hey, I think this thing is probably a thing, which is actually quite common, mm. I think, in uh, the physics universe where mm-hmm. there's a whole lot of like, probably this exists, <laughs> <laughs> but we're not sure. I mean... Theories exist for a reason. That's true. That's true. Which is like so interesting because like, there's so much overlap between physicists and uh, theological individuals of like, probably this is a thing, but we're not actually sure. Um, yep. It's all faith-based. It is all faith. It is. Oh, whoa. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, the first radio commercial was for a real estate developer mm. in New York City. Mm, okay. Uh, also, radio is actually an extremely important tool for astronomers. Mm. Because radio waves are part of the electromagnetic spectrum, mm. one of the fundamental forces of nature, mm-hmm. stars, quasars, planets, galaxies, and dust galaxies, because I don't know what the fuck that is, but I'm intrigued. <laughs> uh, but they admit them. Mm. Some of the earliest attempts to use radio to investigate the stars came at the turn of the 20th century when astronomers attempted to pick up radio emissions emanating from our sun. Oh. Today, radio astronomy is an entire field of dedicated scientists pointing massive radio arrays at the stars in an effort to glimpse things unseen by the naked eye. One of the most impressive radio telescopes in the U.S. is the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, Robert C. Bird Greenbank. Jesus. Fucking Christ, that was a mouthful. A uh, <laughs> telescope located in West Virginia. Mm. The telescope is the largest fully steerable radio telescope in the world. And the machine is so sensitive to radio waves that Wi-Fi is illegal oh. in the 13,000 square mile national radio quiet zone surrounding the telescope. Oh, shit. Yeah. So um, That's hardcore. So, you know, if you tune your radio, it's, it feels like such a it's like weird radio, right? Like yeah. you might pick up some shit coming from <laughs> the sun. <laughs> What if the sun has a podcast? What would the, what would the sun's podcast be about? Okay, now that's some real midnight gospel. That shit is right some, that is some midnight gospel <laughs> shit. Time to go home and watch midnight bo- gospel. But yeah, uh, God, that man. was that was a little bit more history than oh. sciencey. But you know, fuck it, it still counts. It's it's historical science. It is historical science. Boom. Uh, yeah, yes. and don't be trying to turn on your Wi-Fi and hotspot in this area in West Virginia because they will yeah. ping your ass. Yeah, that might, I don't want to know what that fine would be. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that feels like that'd be like a a four digit fine, and I'm just like, damn, yo, they take their shit seriously. Like, trying to, <laughs> just trying to get my Google Maps up, yo. I've been just lost. I'm trying to leave, motherfucker. I'm trying to leave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that was that was some radio science. Maybe maybe next time we meet, I'll come up with some more actual sciencey radio science. That could be a uh, radio science minute part two. Hey, next I'm, episode. I'm down for it. Always down to hear about the radio. But yeah, so uh, <laughs> that was inspired by Alistair, the, the uh, radio the radio demon, demon who? who I had a friend who literally <laughs> used the term uh, for him to say that he scare rouses her. <laughs> Well, which is especially funny because apparently he's canonically asexual. Yeah. No. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I'm not going to get too much on a tangent because I could talk about how fucking cool the show is probably mm-hmm. for a while. But yes, Alistair the Radio Demon is canonically Arrow Ace. So, yes. Which, it, you know, makes so, some of the stuff that happens in uh, AO3 mm-hmm. a little uncomfortable, but, mm-hmm. you know... We always, always, keep, always, we always, always keep it weird. We keep it weird there. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, a, fan fiction doesn't give a fuck about what the characters think. <laughs> they are fiction. On that note, 
That was Christine Kitchens, the scientist supreme. Great. <laughs> Bringing a new stream of consciousness to you whenever you need it. Full blast straight to the dome. <laughs> no filter. Not a one. And I was your Simp Master Thirst King, Joe Kane. Now get the fuck out.